Understand by equivalence. Hmm? Balance. That's what he says. What do you understand by? How would you explain equivalence? Let me compare it to something else versus equality. If I have a fraction equivalent to another fraction versus a fraction equal to itself, right? What's the difference between equality and equivalence? Well, let us, let us use a fraction. Suppose I have three-fourths. What is an equal fraction to three-fourths? Six-eighths is equivalent. Six-eighths is equivalent because it represents the same thing, but it's dressed up in different colors, so to speak. So equivalence represents the same thing, but they do not look exactly alike. They do not look exactly alike. So if I want something three quarters equal three quarters, three, qu three quarters equivalent to six eighths. And we can build equivalent fractions by either multiplying by a, a, a given one, like two over two or three over three, or if we are at the point where we can reduce the fraction to lowest term, right? So we have equivalence is a little shady difference from equal, equality. That's what we do because we build fractions. We build fractions. Because if we have, um, if we have two fractions to multiply, we multiply the numerators and the denominators and that fraction is now representing the product of two fractions. But that's what happens when we are forming equivalences. That's what happens when we are forming equivalences. And I want to back up and say something about the use of manipulators that I've mentioned it in here already. Do not be shy in taking manipulatives to high school classes. Do not be shy. Do not be shy, because when we are looking at it, when we are touching it, when we are manipulating the different um, models that we bring into class, it opens our understanding a lot more. And it takes away the burden of recalling procedures, because we have a good grasp of what it is that we are looking at. Right here. Sometimes our uh, teachers use fractions first because it's easy to make to make them go through the experience of making their own in order that they will understand that the R of R represents a whole fraction without grades of that same bar, the same strip, holding it for the C that for one fourth. In the upper of college, school children spend their lives to make sense. They understand that we have 10 nine digits to make up, 10 digits to make our number system 0, 0, 9. No range of application class, they develop a sense of very large and very small, and they learn to compare them. Now, Compare comparisons made by students. Uh, um, they have very good understanding how the pattern says about that, especially if the numbers are far apart. Suppose I say 10, I suppose I say 100. Most graduate students will make the connection 
Digits we have in our number system. We have 10. Yes? How many alphabets we have? 26. Now, if I do not put any conditions, if I do not put any conditions, all I'm saying is everybody has 10 digits to their disposal who use the decimal system and they have 26 letters of the alphabet. And many, many countries use the numbers and letters combination to make it. And we know that permutations are different from combinations. Permutations, the order matter. So if I have AB123, that's a different um, license, 1234, right? It's a different license plate than if we have 1234AB, right? Because of the positioning of the symbols. But the thing about it is today, I'm teaching students at the university level. How many people do we have roughly in Jamaica? Say nearly 2 million. Nearly 2 million, right? As a person worked out a problem, and today I was sitting here marking it while I was waiting for this class, and they give me 678. So a lot of people should be running around with what you would say. Duplicate the, the allies numbers. Do we see that? Because we have two million people, say we realize one million of them. Because some people are younger, some people do not have a car, and so on. But do we understand where I am what I'm talking about now when I talk about number sense? If we have to, the only thing we have, the only thing we have are the number digits and we have the alphabet. So if I can only make 678 license plates, something should have gone off in this person and said I made a miscalculation because more than 678 people have cars in Jamaica and, and on, camp on campus, let us put it on campus. I mean, we can even bring it down to that because some people have two cars, some people have three cars. Maybe their wife has a car, they, they have a car, and probably they have a commercial vehicle or something that they, so do you know my 678 numbers would be running out very quickly? So what I'm saying, do you understand what I'm talking about number sense now? Number sense doesn't mean that I know every, I know to the last, you know, digit what, what the, the cause, but you should say, I must be doing something wrong here. I should not submit 678. Do we understand that? Do we, do we know what is a permutation? If I put no, no limits on it, suppose I say I do not want two of the same numbers together, or if I say I want a different number for everything, and I, it cannot start with zero. So if I, if, let me, if I have, I have it here. If I have to make four digits, one, two, three, four. That's four digits, and I have to make two letters, right? And I put no restriction on it at all. I have a choice of 10 digits for the first, 
10 digits for the second, 10 digits for the third, 10 digits for the fourth. So that means I'm going to have 10 to the fourth, right? That's just for my numbers. And then I'm going to have 26 digits. I'm going to have 26 digits for my first letter, 26 letters to choose from, from my first letter, and 26 digits to choose from. That's it. So then I'm going to have 10 to the fourth times 26 squared, which should make more sense if we were to license the number of people who own cards in a country. Do we see that? Now, good afternoon. What I can do, also, I can put restrictions on it. I do not want any license plate to start with a zero. So how many choices do I have to fill the first gap? Basically, exactly nine. Do we see that? We have nine digits for the first, right? Now, suppose I do not want the same digit to be here, right? How many digits, how many choices I have for the second digit? You mean you don't want the same digit to be a second? Yes, I don't want a nine. Suppose it turned out to be a three. I do not want a three. This is number of choices. That is not the number on the license plate. Mm -hmm. This is number of choices, right? You don't want the same number. I do not, whatever number is here, I do not want that. It's another nine because now I can put a zero because I did not want that on there. But this is, this is working out the problem, but not working out the problem. I want to show you how important number sense turns out to be because I don't know exactly I know that 678 license plates available to me in Jamaica wouldn't begin to address the, address the problem on campus, more so on the whole island. Do we see that? So if you, if you have an idea of what I'm looking for in terms of size, in terms of whatever, I need millions of um, choices, options to make. Um, America has 400. 400,000, 400 million or something, 350 million, I want that, it's not the 400 right now. But Japan, China, China has 5 million people. Where are they going to get, say, 3 million, 3 million people have, you know, cars? Where are you going to get these numbers from? Do we see that? So we have to, we have to know that 678 is not the beginning. Do we understand? So that is what I mean by number Sense. If I am going from here to, um, what is this, to St. Thomas, I must know that if I'm getting a number that is larger than the distance from here to, say, um, St. Anne, I should have a kind of a sense, you know, in terms of what I know about the island. Do we see that? That's what I'm talking about, number sense. And it puts us in the ballpark. And we say, oh, 678 can't be, I must be doing something wrong. So that's what I say about number sense. So how do this times this, that number could not be this large? Or, we do not know exactly what the number is, but the number we have on Facebook causes a lot of work to come on to say, this does not be like that, and then it will answer. So when you have one of them, you are able to make your strengths. So in order to get this one of them, students should be able to calculate that speed. They should be able to calculate that speed. Use approximation, as I said, to estimate. Understand the connection and relationship between numbers and use them with their calculation. Now, which also should have a sense of the size of a number in the relationship of the number. They should be able to say to themselves, if I multiply a thousand by ten, I should get a reasonably larger number than a smaller number. They should understand the concept of multiplying by one. They should understand the concept of multiplying by zero. And sometimes students even in the secondary schools are not on their feet when it comes to multiplying by zero. They should be able to switch between equivalent 
Do we understand the concept of cognitive overload? Do we understand that concept? Anybody want to, to, to explain it as they understand it? Is it that um, the person is, has so many different um, bits of information about you? So you have a lot of information, a lot of knowledge about various things. Mm -hmm. And all of that is there in the brain, but then you can't relate one to the other. Yeah, there's no, there, there, there are no intersections, there are no linkages that are made. And these things, after a while, if, if we begin to train our... That's right. And, and you really go to cognitive overload in that case, because you're striving to keep everything in its own corner. The thing about it is that if we are able to link things, like for instance, we have whole numbers. We understand that. We can look at relative sizes and so on and so forth. But do we see any linkages between fractions, decimals, percent, ratio, proportion? Do we see any? Do we do we introduce these things as separate entities and never bring it together where we make a connection? Do we ever try to make a connection or show kids that when we're talking about a fraction, we have the decimal equivalent, we have the percentages equivalent, we have a ratio equivalent? Do we ever do that? Or we just say, today we're doing ratio, and when we finish ratio, we go do percentages and never link it further. Do we do that? Do we link these things for our students? And I, I do a lot of, I do a lot of that for um, for my daughter. I find that you know she tends to come home with lots of notes or something. She just she's a note taker. Yeah, she, she, she tries to keep up. Yes, but when I ask her, you know, direct question. There is no there is no correlation to do anything. So I I spend a lot of time on on the white on the white board mm -hmm. in a in a classroom that I have before. You know, and go through all of these things. You have to. Because when we look at a fraction, right? We should know what the denominator is saying to us. We should know what the numerator is saying to us. We should know, we should be able to draw a line. We should, if we have a, a, a group of fractions together, we should be able to draw a line. And I'd like you to list in any order the fractions in this group of fractions that would be less than a half and greater than a half. Some of our kids don't know, they do, especially if there's an odd number in the numerator. Especially if there's an odd number in the numerator. Because if I have 5 over 7, a lot of kids cannot tell me where to put it on this side, to the, to the left of the line, or to the right of the line. Okay? If they have a, a number of um, um, fractions to add together, they should be able to go through with the same number sense thing again and say, well, this is less than a half, this is less than a half, the pro problem used to really be less than a whole, and I could kind of collect and put them together. Because we as teachers need to establish that in their minds because it's too much cognitive overload for them to have everything in a separate package and never the twain shall meet. So a good exercise, anybody knows this, this card game named Remembrance? You, you have to remember, you don't know that card game where, you know, there was a six here and you pick up another one and it's not a six, but you remember that the six is here and you, you've never played that game. We, I don't mean, I don't mean like you make up these cards, you know, we can make them up for our children, right? They should know that they should know um, 
equivalences and equalities between fractions and um, between fractions and percent. So if my child picks up a half and picks up 50 over 100, they should know that those two are the same thing we're talking about. One we're calling it percentage, right? And what we're talking about, sharing a unit into two parts. But the unit is shared into two parts for 50 over 100. So we should have the, 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 the percentage equivalent to the everyday fractions, like a half, a quarter, 75%. We should know that um, if we have 25 over 100, we should know that we are less than a half, right? Because that is exactly a quarter. But if we just teach fractions in isolation, and we teach percentage in isolation, and we teach ratio in isolation to all these different things, that is when we get to cognitive overload because it's not necessary. It's not necessary. Look at yes, you know they're not different. They're, they're expressing the same idea. Especially with ratio yesterday, they're like, like you'd say. Say student pupil, you know, um, teacher pupil ratio, yeah. And you say one teacher to four students, and you're like, I don't understand, man. You know, when you, you try to explain it, and then, you know, you probably bring the quarter in, and you yes. know, it's like they, they don't understand. They don't, and there's no explanation behind it, but they just know that's ratio. So they don't really get yeah. the meaning of ratio. And is. then they have, <laughs> with ratio, they have to learn notation, notation. additional notation, notation, and they have to understand that percentage is a good representative, a good way to represent a fraction. Because if I'm talking about people who use Digicel, right, versus people who use Lime, right? Then those are things that you could get into a child's head with because they are so up. Because most people now in Jamaica have two phones, except me. Except me. I have one phone. One hand phone. You have many phones? No. Okay. <laughs> so the thing is, though, we can talk about. We, if we, if we, if phone is such an interesting thing for, for people in general and especially yes, students, they love their phones. They, they, you can keep them quiet for hours. Just hand them the latest phone, and they will go and do everything on it and ignore the rest of the world. So that is a good place that we could begin to talk about phone. Survey people. How many people have two phones? One line, one. Digicel. How many people have one phone? How many people um, you have surveyed out of, say, five? Because you have enough people in your class that if you have 43 people in your class, 43 times five is a whole lot of data that, that you can summarize on the board and talk about fraction and their equivalences and the percentages and all of that. There is a lot of math everywhere around us and i've never seen such a fascination with phones across the world everybody becomes equal when you're talking about phone usage and purchase and do you see now that um at and is putting out watches like for seventeen thousand dollars and um twenty five thousand dollars and those kinds of monies that you can wear everything you want to know about yourself and the world on your wrist. So they have they have all kinds of watches for all kinds of money that they are putting out. But if anybody wants my advice, I wouldn't buy it because next week they're going to have the new improved. So if you pay seventeen thousand for the watch today, you're going to it becomes up to me. Yes. So if you have a watch for seventeen thousand dollars. And you have a, a um, watch for seventeen thousand dollars today, the thirteenth of April. By the thirteenth of May or June, they want you to stand up in line again for something that they're going to put out at twelve oh one for twenty five thousand dollars for a watch. 
and knowledge are the best. And those are things that you can simply Google. <laughs> yes, but you can Google it on your hand. Yeah, but you don't see you, don't, you, see. <laughs> you just don't have to do anything else. All you need is a watch. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So the thing is that when if but you see you get your email and you can you can speak into your phone. You, you can speak into your phone, you can you can uh, find out your blood pressure on your phone, you can do all kinds of things. So the thing is that they have us on a string, and if they turn it this way, we have to go. If they turn it that way, you have to go. You know what I realized too, and I think they had the same, the girls too, saying that you know, with with, with technology, with how technology is advancing, it's almost like you're never going to be in your brain again. And what I realized with some students too, with this, with with with, with math. You see, with the calculator, like I've seen it already, and I'm like, a student who is like 16 years old, and you know, they're writing in steps and doing, and six over two, and they took out their calculator. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And, yeah. and they're saying, okay, and take up your phone, and I'm like, 14 over seven, and they took up their phone and go to the calculator. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. That's two times three, and they take up their phone. And, they phone. Yes. Uh -huh. and I'm saying, you see, it's like so much that they're becoming dependent on. Well, the thing about dependence on the on the mechanics of the thing is one thing, and a lot of people frown on it. But the, what the po the point that is being made now is that with the new technologies, you are able to do bigger and greater things beyond the calculation. The calculation is only the vehicle that takes you there. But you're supposed to have a kind of thinking, the innovation, and mm -hmm. everything behind and it. It's with the permutation that the you whole said. Building, 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 building,
think about this page five, page five. Understanding the value of digits in their place in a number is the basis for counting and comparing numbers. As I said before, if the numbers are five, five, like ten, and a hundred, we do not have any problems. But if we have a lot of problems with fractions, so compare two so in the family years, where that value are based on multiples of ten. Zero is the place holder, and that the decimal point is the marker that separates whole numbers from fractional parts. In other culture, now we have learned that we have a hundred thousand, we have like black, zero, 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 comma, zero, zero, zero. What we learn is to be the same. That is something new. Some people use commas, and so I, I know that sometimes in the Chinese speaking countries they use commas. As with the way of place value chart, saying along with place value and reading decimal numbers, it helps to make sure that this will have difficulty with comparing decimals. For example, 31.265 should be read as 31 holes, so which are best in best, and 210, 600, and 5,000. Because with this kind of uh, practice, they will be saying the same place value. They will be saying the place value. Because what we read most often is 31.25. They have no mention of this value. So we say 31 holds, 2 tenths, 600, and 5,000. They are saying it. They are repeating it. They're speaking to their brain to retain it. And so they have anchored themselves by using that kind of language. The approach to other students in processing large numbers that are common in the media. A lot of times in the media, because they are who they are and they get information from companies that operate with large numbers, they will say 1.2 million. They will say 3.6 million. We are aware at the certain point that we can express numbers in scientific notation. Or you can use um, the for smaller numbers, we can use the expanded notation. So if we have 360, we could write 6 times 10 to the 0 plus 1 times 10 to the one power first power plus three times ten to the second power. And in that case, we are looking at this value. And it's being cemented. When we close our eyes, we can see that. Now, I want you to listen carefully. I'm going to speak slowly so that you can understand it. I want you to write something down for me. On one line, I want you to write a pair of decimals. One point zero five three. 1.053. Leave a space because you're writing these numbers in pairs. On the same line, write 1.06. Next pair. 1.06. 1.06. 1.06. 1.06. 1.06. 1.06. 1.06. 1.06. 1.06. 1.06. 1.06. 1.06. 1.06. 1.06. 1.06. 1.06. 1.06. 1.06. 
Under that, you can, under the first number, you can write the second number in the second pair. 4.08. Its pair, its partner is 4.7. The third pair, 3.72. Its partner is 3.073. All right, okay. Now, what is the instruction that the student was given? The instruction that the student was given is to, for each pair of decimals, so the pair is on the line, one line, right? So you're going to, the, the, uh, you, the, the instruction is circle the one that is larger of the pair. So you're going to make three circles. The first line has a pair, the second line has a pair, and the third line has a pair. Now the, the instruction to student A was to circle the larger number. I'm going to tell you what the person circled. On the first two, they circled 1.053. So circle that. Circle it. On the second line, they circled 4.08. And what do you think they're going to circle on the? They're going to, yes, they're going to circle 3.073. All right? Okay. Now, that's a set of three pairs of numbers. I'm going to give you another set for student B. Student B. 0 0.4. Its partner in that pair is 0 0.457. The next pair under that is going to be 0 0.36 and 0 0.216. The last pair in this threesome is 5.62 and 5.736. All right, what's the instruction again? Circle the one that is larger. The, in this, in, for student B, they circled the first three numbers. They circled 0 0.4, circle it, because we're going to be discussing it. 0 0.36. Five point six two. So they just came down in a line and they circled that. Now that is <laughs> do we have the number sense here? Do we understand place value here? Do we understand that? Anybody want to make a comment? It says for each pair of decimal numbers. Circle the one that is larger. What do you think about the first, the, the, the student A? Student A was saw that all, like, more digits. Like more digits. Yeah, more more digits. digits. <laughs> the longer the better. The longer the, the, longer, the bigger. Digits. The longer the bigger. The longer the bigger. Right? So, are they, are they thinking similar or are they different? Student B seemingly guessed. Student B seemingly guessed. Make some guessing. Mm. Or maybe just, maybe this may be more decimal places. Or, 
the thing about it is that we do not we do not B, B, the student B, we have 0 0.4 compared to 0 0.457. What, yes, but what I'm saying is, if we were to put decimal, additional decimal places to, 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 to cover three decimal places in 0 0.4, to get it to three decimal places, oh, they would have to put a zero, zero there. So they do not know, they do not know the place value. And remember, a number has place value, it has face value, and it has the real value. The real value. It has the face value, it has the place value and it has the real value. So the place value for four in student B, right, they have 0.4. They do not know that the, 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 the place value is tenths, T-E-N-T-H-S. They do not know that. And so therefore, we have a situation where they are lost and it is our fault, I'm telling you that from now. Because you know what? We say it all the time, we hear it widespread in society. How do we say one, five, three? Or how do we say that? 153. You see what I'm saying? But we shouldn't say N. We should not say and it's 153 because we shouldn't say until we see a decimal point. Till we see a decimal point, we should not say and because it's 153 whole numbers and some fractional parts. But I don't think we're ever going to get it out of our society because it's reinforced daily, minutely, hourly on TV, in the classroom, everywhere. But we do not reach the end until we reach the decimal point. So my dear child didn't know that we're talking about four fifty-seven thousands and four thousands, right? Do we see that? Do we see that? And also, because we have tens, hundreds, thousands. So the thing is that sometimes we mislead our students. Now my guy, the student A, that's my child. My child says, this number is longer, it has to be bigger. I don't have to analyze anything at all. I can ignore the decimal point. I can ignore the place value. I can ignore the face value. I could ignore everything because longer must be more. Do you see how a child can leave our classroom totally under a misconception that we didn't even try to foster, but we didn't try to correct either because sometimes we don't even think that this child might be down this road, right? So, we have place value, we have face value, and we have real value. So when I have 153, I have three ones, five tens, and 100. Once they get over the decimal point, they do not know what it is that we're talking about. And so therefore, we have to be careful. All right, let us come back to the decimal. One pair, first pair, that is that. One point zero five three. Yeah, I did that on the thing, but we can move it forward. As we discussed that, okay? Zero. Okay. I'm looking for, I'm looking for my stuff. I can move this along, can't I? 
If there is no doubt that this is four parts, but which one would you take? Which one would you want? You would want two, right? And I would say, but I want two. And then we could get to the point where we would essentially get to the equality part. Because this is definitely shared into four parts, but not four equal parts. The other thing too, that when we are talking about fractions, we generally have a square or a rectangle or a pizza or something which represents a whole unit. But we can have, we can have groups of items that are to be shared equally as well. So if I have 35 things to share for seven people, right, then I would have to know that they get a number of things, not a part. They get a part of the whole sum, but it's not, the, the things that they are given are not in fractional parts responding to a whole. It is responding to a group of things. So if I have to share, um, if I have to share um, a group of, say, say I have a lot of oranges and you know I'm overwhelmed by them, and I bring a basket of oranges to class, or some people give away tomatoes, some people give away anything. But I'm saying if we want to share it now, some people might not want a whole seven tomatoes but if i said you, you you can share it and then you can go take yourself uh, your share and get, hand it out to other people but i want it to be shared equally then each person takes one until it's finished in in in, in sequence and you will see that it is a fractional part it is a fractional part but it is not part of a whole we didn't cut into the tomato we share the tomatoes as whole units as a part of a collection, a part, a number that we can share. Yes. Well, well, let me tell you that talking, bringing up this idea of a um, circle uh, of um, vocabulary in math, it cannot be overstressed. It's important because the same, not the same kind of language that we use every day, right? has some meaning that can differ in um, mathematics. For instance, we say intersection, but generally in everyday language, we think of intersection as a meeting of two roads. Some people call it a junction, some people call it intersection, but in our language, when we're talking about set notation and Venn diagrams, we have intersection meaning something else. We also have union. When we think about union, it's closer in meaning to what we do when we are dealing with sets in the regular world, because union is sort of bringing together, bringing together. But it still has a slightly different meaning when we are looking in the mathematics. And so there's... Yes, it's closer than the intersection. It's closer than the intersection. Because we, yes, yes, right. But the thing is, what we could do is get our students to draw a, a intersection of two roads and let them color one road one way in one color and, you know, maybe, maybe strips going in one direction, strips going the opposite direction, and wherever it overlaps, that would be the intersection and so therefore we have lots of things to do because you know what a lot of times what i'm going to say this word and i don't know if it, if it applies but students have a mindset that today i'm going to take notes and i'm going to learn what it is that they're teaching me right but tomorrow they come back with the mindset that i'm going to learn something different and as again, they don't see the, the, the intersections. They don't see the linkages between what I learned yesterday and what I learned today. We as teachers must provide them, must provide it for them. Okay. Yes. So, so here we have a situation. What? 
536. Okay, now let us review and reflect. Uh, the following two problems encourage students to use visual images and estimation. Estimation and number sets are like, like partners that you want to cling close to your brain. Number sense and estimation. We want to have that very close to our chest. But just let's, let us just finish this, what we have here. The point is that there are shapes differently, and we have to undo that shaping with the space to come into our students. I think we tell them that I'm sorry, but with uh, students who attend our classes. Making sense of fashion also means that students are able to compare fashion and find equivalent representation of fashion. Comparing larger, smaller, larger, smaller. If they are dimension very early in this lecture, we could see one half and one thing. By drawing on it to be larger because it is larger than two. So they would put the when you call it to stand in the wrong direction because you are seeking the whole number orientation. Fashion model using paper folding to create models such as fashion strips and rectangles and fashion walls made up of multiple fashion suits can be used for open ended investigation. And 10 fractions that are equivalent. So if we have a rectangle and we draw equal parallel lines, equal equal set parallel lines all the way down, we can have the upper hand to do it, second hand to do it, we can have the third one to do it, the third, and so on. So we can make a fraction of that. In the early years of the secondary school, and we find out that the children who are coming from the primary. And not very versed in it would pay off dividends in a large degree if we spend some time correcting any misconceptions that they might have about fraction. Now, All right, we're going to stop here for a minute. I'm going to give you another exercise to do. Write, everybody, you're writing now. You're going to write four tenths. You're going to write 4, 47, 4 over 47. You're going to write 4 tenths first, 4 over 47, and you're going to write 4 over 8. We have another group of three fractions, 99 over 100. 99 over 100. 6 over 7, 15 over 16, all right, now what the child is asked to do and you're going to do it is to order the fractions in each set from smallest to largest. Order the fraction in each set from smallest to largest. What I want you to do to participate is to explain the visual images or number sense that you use to order these fractions. Anybody can jump in. Anybody can jump into this dialogue right here.
All right, anybody want to, uh, anybody want to start? Anybody want to start with the first three? Our friends overseas, do you want to start? Would anybody like to start? Who's this? Is this? Yes. Go ahead. Um, okay, so the first one, we have four ifs to the smallest, you said to largest? Yes. So it's four, four, four over 47, four tenths and four ifs. We are saying 4 over 47. Everybody write that down. 4 over 47. Then we are saying what? What's the next one? 4 tens. All right. And then we say 4 eighths, right? Now, what? when I see a fraction 4 tenths, what is it telling me? What is it telling me when I see four tenths? Because I'm trying to make uh, engaging sizes now, right? It's what? Right, five of ten would be half. So every time you see a fraction, remember I told you earlier, probably what we should do is give us children a bunch of fractions make a vertical line and then what you would do is say all the things that are less than and close up to they don't have to put them in any order yet we just want to classify them in two big groups less than a half greater than a half yes okay so you were right in saying that it before over 47 right I don't know, maybe if I'm sharing, I don't know, there's something that the person would get a small piece if you're going to get the 447 of it, is right? If you're sharing for 47 persons, then it's just yes, four things. They wouldn't get any of the pizza. You'd have to take a spoon to pick up your, your share, right? <laughs> and then they should know that for a fraction to be equivalent to a half, the bottom should be twice, the denominator should be twice the numerator. If anything less than that, then we know that we are less than a half, yes? And anything dead on the money, like four and eight. For eight is twice times four, so we know that is exactly equivalent to one half. But we should run games like this on our children for them to get the idea that you can make an estimation because you have some number sense and you can see where these fractions are going. Now we are at off the, the place where we're going to order 99 over 100, 6 over 7, and 15 over 16. What are we going to do here? Anybody can jump in. Ladies first. A uh, lady went first from overseas. You, yeah, men, you do the, you do it now. You, you do that now. Okay. So we're going from the smallest to the largest. Mm -hmm. so we have six sevens. 15 sixteenths and 99 hundredths. How do you justify that now? How do you justify that? How do I justify that? Mm -hmm. The fraction that's left from, from, the, from the whole is less. Aha! Ah, we have some thinking here going on, right? All right, so tell me what you had with first. You had um, 99 over 100. You had, what's the difference there is? One, 100. 100. Right. We have 6 over 7. We have 
one seven, right? And then the, the one that we had, 15, 16, we had one sixteen. So then, do you see where the number six comes in? Do you see where the number six comes in? I am looking at the fractions, but it's kind of a, kind of a, it's only one difference. It's only one difference. It's only one different, different. So I do not know exactly, but I could go to the alternative, right? Now, one over a hundred, one thing shared for a hundred people. That is small, right? <laughs> one thing shared for seven people and one thing shared for 16 people. So if we want to put these in order from least to greatest, which one would go first? Which one would go first from least to greatest? No, I'm talking about the residue. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, from, from least to greater. Oh, 100. One over 100, then one over 16. Mm -hmm. And then we would have, we would have what? 116. Right? So we'd have one over 100, 116, then 17. Do you see how we can use, if somebody can see the logic between what's going on and the number sets, it's not such a difficult problem because you don't have to rack your brain too much over um, the, the what? The, the, the one difference because if the, the given fractions, 99 plus 1, 15 plus 1, 6 plus 1. So then, what we want to say then is that from least to greatest what you're going to do for um what you're going to do how, how did you put them in order the ones that you were given not the ones that you generated from least to greatest least to greatest mm -hmm. okay so the thing is, you can use the flip side, and you got to see a connection between them before you can make that kind of definition. Now, I want you to use numbers one through seven. List them. List them. I don't know why this. I want to hear from people somewhere else. What happened here? Why doesn't this come off? You have your mics off? Right here, the mic is off for them. Their mic is off. Okay, what I want you to do is to write two fractions, and I need to show it to you on paper. It's on now. Okay. Um, I want you to write one rectangle on top of another plus one rectangle on top of another less than one like so can you see it can you see it yes so you're going to write two fractions from these numbers one through seven that when you add them together it's less than one less than one that is an open-ended question. And that's a good question for students, for, for you to see how they can appreciate what is going on. Do we see that? Hello? Yes. All right. So you see the format that I want it in? It's a fraction plus another fraction should be less than one. You're going to write it down and then we're going to talk about it. You're going to write it down and we're going to talk about it. Be aware of your thinking because you want the child to be aware of why they're saying what they're saying. So you be aware of your thinking. You're going to use numbers 
One, three, four, five, six, or seven. If you have two in there, take it out, please. Two is not legal. Two is not legal. One, three, four, five, six, or seven. You can only use a number once. For the denominator or the numerator? Oh, in the whole dialogue, you can only use the number once. It's supposed to be less than one. What I do, I, I tear my paper into four little pieces so that I can shift them and shift them and shift them. If I write, if I have four little squares, I can write my numbers and then I'm free to move them around to suit my life. <laughs> the what? You only need four. You only need four. You only need four. Make four little squares of paper. Use use each number, each digit once, and you can shift them and place them anywhere you please. Two is illegal. Two should not be in there. One, three, four, five, six, or seven. Have I ever said that word in my mouth since I started talking today? No, I didn't say eight. Nowhere. Except in the, the first three fractions of the top, uh, eight was in the D, now the uh, four over eight. Exactly, but I use one, four, two, and three. Oh, come on yourselves and see so you can get the best, best answer. But there's more than one answer here. Eh? There's more than one. There should be. It's an open-ended question. And then you're, well, probably the two smallest, you know. Uh -huh. Yes. They're easy to find initially, but if you start putting conditions on them, but I wouldn't put conditions on my students right away. That's why I was saying asking me initially. There's no eight in what you're asking me. There's no eight. Okay. So if you tear your paper into four little pieces, right, you can always shift and turn and make a better composition. And that would be easy. And remember, hands on make brains on. Yes? Hands on make brains on. All right. Somebody, somebody dare to tell us what they have. Hello? Yes. I have one third and four seven. You have one third and four seven. Is that less than one? Yes, it is. You said one third. I'm doing yours. One third and four seven. And we're adding. You know, sometimes we have our students to cross multiply when they're, they're adding fractions. Have we ever done that? No. Oh, you never done that? They call it multi method, but it's not recommended. It does happen. Oh, yeah. I've seen, I've seen. Cross you multiply. You multiply this way, that is the multi way, and then. The, the piece that goes this way is the denominators. Yes. <laughs> so if we if we add those fractions together, what do we get? Nineteen. 
19 over 21. Can anyone do any better? One six plus three seven. One plus three seven. Plus three Do it, do it, do it. <laughs> you don't have a two. You do not have a two. So we have that will be seven plus what eighty. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Twenty five over forty two. And is that greater than a half or less than a half? Is that greater than a half or less than a half? <laughs> Anybody has any better? Anybody has any better? Alright. <laughs> so do you see that rather than um arguing about this, that and the other, if you get to like something like this, they have to be original. They have to be original. So it's an open-ended question. Right? So they can look at it. Now if we look at one sixth, right? Just look at one sixth without any multiplication, cross or anything. We have one sixth, which is pretty small, right? And then we have three sevenths. Three sevenths is almost a half, isn't it? Isn't three sevenths almost a half? What should I have in the numerator with denominator seven to make it exactly a half? Numerator, 3.5. And some of my children are going to find it difficult to, 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 to make, um, and a half of an uh, odd number. So we have to take them down that road, right? Because three, it can't be four because the, the denominator would have to be eight, right? So we're, we're, what are we left with? Separating, yes. We are left with separating. And so therefore, we have a situation where this would be an open-ended question, a nice question for our children, and we would be able to get them to begin to conceptualize sizes of fractions. And that backward thinking where we said we have 99 over 100 is just a 100 shy. 100 is a very small piece, right? Then we have 1 seventh. That is small, but not as small as 1 seventh. And we can go from largest to smallest or smallest to largest, right? Now, if we have the same denominator for everything, that is the way we go most of the time in terms of comparing fractions. But we can compare fractions in any shoes they're wearing. If the shoes is 100 or 7 or 6, it doesn't matter. It's like, I always think about, like, for instance, fractions, say a child gets... 99 questions correct out of 100 and you mark it in terms of you know you write it 99 out of 100 yeah. you know that's basically you giving them a percentage so i was always that's thinking true. you know why not just put the percentage alone you know <laughs> well the thing about it is because i am thinking about the fraction base of it but that's another way to connect with your children do you know that if you give your children say 50 percent they might not connect to 50 over 100. That they got 50 correct out of the 100. Yes, for sense. Yes. You see what I'm saying? They might not connect. But suppose you give them um, some other number, just a fraction, and say work out your percentages. They're going to try because they live in percent. They live in percent. And mothers and fathers who do not get into the math business want to see percent. They understand that is out of a hundred. Okay? All right. Now, 
the um so what we got out of that question we got open-ended question we got original thinking we got comparisons like you say who can do one better do something better who can get the smallest or nearest to one or something all of those all of those now if i say what caused you to choose the um you notice that you had one three four five six seven right what people were trying to do to get the smallest number is to get the bigger what denominator to get the bigger denominator because we run into a big problem if you do not understand that seven over three is not the same as three over seven and you believe me i want you to believe me that sometimes depending on the questions we ask we do, we do not know really what the problem is because it doesn't touch that weak point that person has mental computation is like estimating and with mental computation i said you know who is the wife of of um, mental computation number six number six they are partners they are partners number sense and mental computation are partners they live in together successfully they live together successfully all right now let us look at um the different laws the different laws how many laws we know we know we know identity elements for addition what is our identity element for addition hello turn on your mic so i can hear you what is our identity element for what does our identity element do what effect does it have on the whole matter the number stays the same, right? Identity for addition says, what I started, I ended, but I added something to it. So what is that something? Zero. That is zero. Right? What you said? Oh, okay, yes. And anytime you map something onto yourself, that is what kind of um, law. What kind of law is that? It says that you start with an eight, you add zero, you end with an eight. So the eight maps to eight. When eight maps to eight, what is our law for that? What's the name of that law? What property? What property? Reflexive. When the action comes back to itself, is that reflexive? That is reflexive. All right. Now, what the zero is the identity under addition? What is the identity under multiplication? One. 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 One is the identity under multiplication because it leaves me standing it leaves me standing right where i was i didn't get a change right so if i multiply by one or if i divide by one i am at the same place where i started all right all right inverse elements what's the inverse of addition what's the inverse operation of addition I'm not hearing. Subtraction. Subtraction, yes. So if I go, if I start at a unit, if I start at one point, uh, say zero, which is convenient, and I go seven units to the right, okay, that I'm calling addition on the number line, and I turn back from there seven units i'm going to end up at my starting 
point. All right? So then I'm going to end up at zero. And you can talk about that all day long because you can talk about money. Do you know I went into the store today and I saw this beautiful blouse. And some people, when, when they see something, they like them. I just say, I know it has my name on it. I have to get it. Right? They say it has their name on it. And when I looked in my purse, it was the exact same amount as the cost of the blouse. And so, therefore, I had it and I exchanged it for the blouse. And so, therefore, I have the blouse, but no money. Zero. 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 And let me tell you, no matter how, uh, I would say, um, impossible math seems to people, and they say they can't do it, they will not take wrong change. No matter what, they will not take the wrong change. Yeah? They, will, they, they won't take it. All right? Now, when, when children hit the secondary schools, we go through these properties, the commutative property. How would you explain somebody anywhere? I see your mics are off, so you can talk. How would you explain the commutative property without numbers to a child? How would you, first of all, what is the commutative property? What does it say? What does it say? Commuter, who is a commuter? You're a commuter. Who is a commuter? A commuter is generally a person who do the same thing they do in the morning, going, the same thing they do coming back. So if I go from home to school in the afternoon, I repeat the journey. Now, sometimes if you have other things to do, you might have to pick up a younger child at a different school, or you might have to stop at the dry cleaners, or you might have to stop at the grocery store. They don't call those people commuters. They call, they, what they call commuters are the people who go from point A to point B and, and, and retrace their steps in the, at the next time period. Well, none of us are. <laughs> <laughs> Some people do because sometimes, like if you carpool, with somebody, you know, run the thing, and, and Mr. You know, the commuter, not Fred Express, is a commuter thing. Oh, yeah. Because, uh, you know, you know, you know, so stop here, let me go to the grocery store. Stop here, let me go. I know, I know, yes, but a commuter is really a person yeah, right. who goes from point A to point B and from the point B to point A. So this holds for the, what, what operations? Hello? Hello? What is the um what, what what operation does it hold for? Multiplication, addition. Does it work for subtraction and division? From A to B, then from B to A, you have covered the same number of miles or kilometers, depending on what you use. So the commutative property holds for addition and for multiplication. Yes? Associative. So, so really, let me just say, commutative property holds for order change. Order change, yes? A to B, B to A. Order change. What about associative property? What kind of change we experience in when we're using the associative property? Hello, I'm listening. You don't know how to explain it. 
please write it down. Write it down. Write A plus B in parentheses. Hello. A plus B in parentheses plus C is equal A plus B plus C in parentheses. Now, what did you just do? Pardon me? You change the position of the parentheses. We change the position of the, and parentheses, what does parentheses do to our problems? What does it do? It groups them. So tell me now what happened. I changed the group. Yes, so the order stays the same, but the grouping changes when we're dealing with the associative property. And do you know that the grouping changes in primary school 50 times a day? You're my best friend. Oh, and you're not my best friend anymore. I have this best friend over here. The associative property is rampant, especially in primary school, because they change groupings. You know, my BFF, my best friend for life, lasted about two hours from recess to lunchtime. <laughs> so the thing is, though, that in the associative property, you have group change, and in the commutative property, you have order change. Now, what do we notice about the operations in both the associative and the commutative property? It can be addition or multiplication. Right? So the thing is that we have one operation when we talk about the associative either of addition or not and or multiplication, yes? We have for um, the commutative property, it's either addition or multiplication. Now the one that involves two operation is known as the, the, the one that involves two operation is known as the, that's the one? Speak up, speak up. For the for the, the the property that deals with two operations is called the Hello? Did somebody overseas tell me? Somebody said it, I think. Distributive? Yes, the distributive property. It, well, you have to say it so I can hear it, because I'm near to you, I should be able to hear it. The distributive property has to do with, so don't blame me then if I don't hear it. Don't blame me. Don't blame me if I do not hear. Right? Don't blame me if I do not hear. So here we have a situation where the distributive property deals with two operations. We can have multiplication over addition, or we can have multiplication over subtraction. I don't think they're going to write a left distributive when they're in high school. I think they just stay out there. Now, um, let us uh, stop here for today because it's 6.14 and you have had no break. So next week, I'll see you. People overseas in St. Lucia, please remember you, you, you are experiencing the intervention with your children by now, I hope, and you are constructing your journal. Yes. The 3,000 word essay is due on the April 20th, and we are going to have reports on the 27th and the 5th or the 4th of May. Because of lectures finish for our online on the 8th of May, but we meet on a Monday. Is that clear to everybody? Is that clear? Yes. yes. So, um, the, let me just repeat the, the presentation at the 5th or 4th. Is it 5th or 4th or the 27th? Uh, it's a Monday, whatever is the Monday of the last week. So, as the presentations, when we submit the journals after or before. Um, you're going to submit the journals on the day of the presentation. So you're going to have to submit it to me by email. Okay, yes. 
and you need to submit the, 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 the Learning Ferris 3000 word essay on April the 20th. Next week, next week, next week Monday. Yes, you know that. No, I'm telling you right now. I'm no, I was thinking like because they're so. Do you remember? It's a long time ago I gave that. Oh, you know. uh, a reminder email. But see, I'm giving it to you by word of mouth right here. Some people are coming to the class. It doesn't matter because that I cannot control. They would have the information. They have the information. The information is different from that you gave us. A copy of. Is that on the It's on the email? Yes, I sent email. The intervention yeah. that you went through with us. Um, yeah, I sent. I sent. You sent me everything. I sent all the you don't know what it is? No, it's not true. Which one did she speak in? It's his title. It's title. And that's the one that the paper was That one, no. It's no, it's a question here. Questionnaire. Like, questionnaire. you give it to your student that you're working with, and they, it's, it's a before and after. So make sure you take a copy when it's blank so that you can see if there are any changes in attitude or, or proficiency or whatever. All right, St. Lucia. Have a good week. I'll see you on Monday. All things being equal. All right? Bye. Bye-bye. With my mind. With my mind. I want to see my mic.